Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, September the 6th, we will be praying for students, teachers, parents, and administrators. All those involved in education are asked to bring a backpack, a <coughs> book bag, a briefcase, etc., and put it on the platform uh, as a visual as we pray for the upcoming school year. Tomorrow. September the 6th, also, we will have a prayer walk. We will have a special time of prayer in our worship service on Sunday. And then uh, Bible fellowship groups are encouraged to uh, prayer walk uh, one of the school campuses um, that evening at 6, Eaton High School, Adams Middle School, Sluter Elementary, Nance, uh, and the International Leadership School, or Bonds Ranch Elementary School, the new elementary school across from Cross Church. Um, church business meeting and fellowship will be on Sunday, the September the 13th. There will be a special business meeting uh, to get an update on church finances and it's going to be at the North Richland Hills campus at 6 p.m. After the meeting, there will be a fellowship, so please plan to attend. Um, Financial Peace University, Financial Peace University, FPU, will begin the week of September the 19th through the 23rd. Classes are available uh, in person or via Zoom. Uh, child care is only available for those classes attended in person. Your choices are Sunday mornings, 9 to 1030, Sunday evenings, 430 to 6, or Wednesday evenings, 630 to 8. Uh, as part of the FPU, a new track is also offered, the Legacy journey leads you into the deeper investing, basic estate planning, uh, purposeful living and safeguarding your legacy and discovering keys to generational wealth and generosity. Uh, this will only be offered at the North Richmond Hill campus on Sunday evenings from 4.30 to 6.30. Marriage night simulcast on Saturday, September the 12th from 5.30 to 9.30. Couples, whether you're engaged or been married for 60 years or more, you <clears throat> will not want to miss the date night opportunity to focus on marriage. The, the evening will include simulcast dinner from Kidwell's barbecue, desserts, lawn games, and giveaways. Sign up today at ccdfw.org slash adults. Who is your one? Has the Lord given you an opportunity to share the gospel with someone who needs it? Would anyone like to share with the class your gospel conversation? And I have a prayer request from Henry. Watkins, and uh, Henry had cataract surgery two weeks ago, and uh, it didn't go well. No. Oh, oh. So Tuesday they're going in to repair the surgery. Well, we definitely will keep you in our prayers. Okay. All right, and. Uh, if I could, I'll ask uh, uh, Wallace. <laughs> Wallace Hearn <laughs> to lead us in, in prayer. Okay. Dear Heavenly Father, um, help us to have a good week and watch over those that have had illnesses and surgeries and help them in their recovery and help us to have a good day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.
Well, good morning, everyone. Good to see you. And I also wanted to uh, recognize the fact we have some first time folks with us today. I'm going to ask uh, my wife, Donna, to introduce them. Uh, Mike and Ken Har are with us today, and they're here because they had to evacuate their granddaughter from the uh, St. Charles. I mean, Lake Charles, I don't keep saying the same, Lake Charles area. So we can definitely wow. know that Texas has a lot of that going on too. And so we're glad they're here this morning. Sorry for their circumstances there, but we can also be praying for their family who's been greatly impacted. Her parents are down there. Their son is still also down there. So there are a lot of people involved in this. So we can have prayer, but we're glad to have them with us this morning. We've had our two granddaughters here this week. Um, like Charles, we were there 50 years ourselves. Yes, uh, and uh, they they have been affected. Yeah. So we welcome you guys. Uh, we are still getting used to this classroom. This uh, we've only been here a few weeks, but uh, we're really glad that you guys are here today, and just pray that everything goes well with your family and their recovery and, and getting things back together. Uh, very challenging time. Mm -hmm. And uh, one other thing I didn't. I didn't pick up on it there on the back table. There's also for our new uh, quarter, quarter of lessons is coming up starting next Sunday, next Sunday, the first Sunday in September. This is the <laughs> list of lessons that we will be studying and we'll be in the book of starting out of the book of Isaiah for this next uh, period of time. And uh, that's one of the great books of the Old Testament and uh, you will enjoy it. I am told we asked uh, last couple of weeks about lesson material, who wanted printed and who wanted electronic to get it online. Uh, the electronic, I think uh, we've given the, uh, the office your email address for those of you that request it electronically. So you should get some information about that. If you don't get the information, uh, give, me, give me a call or give uh, uh, Will, Will and I both have the lessons electronically. We can maybe help you with that or, or call the office as well. Printed material, uh, I'm told, will definitely be here by next Sunday. So uh, anyway, if you ask for printed material, uh, I'm sorry it's not here today. I'm not, I'm, I don't know all the reasons beyond that, but uh, we'll... Just blame we'll, it on the virus. Blame <laughs> it on the virus. That's, that's a good suggestion. I appreciate it. Or the hurricane, either one. Okay. <laughs> don't. Don't, if you're grouchy, don't blame that on the virus, though. So, uh, I'm not saying anybody is grouchy. But, uh, uh, all right, we're, we're going to be looking at an interesting uh, topic today. The topic of our lesson this morning is relational investment. And we're going to be, once again, in the book of Song of Solomon, or Song of Songs, as our printed material says. And I would suspect, especially in our age group, in this, in this uh, Bible fellowship group, that everyone is familiar with the game called the game of life, okay? And uh, the game of life, uh, you've got a lot of decisions that you have to make. And so it wouldn't be as difficult for people in our age group or maybe for some young people to be a little bit more challenging as you think about the different stages of life, you know? Marriage or singleness, college or military, kids, no kids, job, and then ultimately retirement. And one of the big decisions that has to be made in that game is how you're going to manage your money, okay? How you're going to make decisions around money. And how much do I save? How much can I spend? And what about uh, giving? What about investment? Oh, and by the way, there's this thing called the IRS. How is that going to impact the money that I have? So those are decisions that have to be made. And, you know, for a few years, I had the opportunity to work in the uh, financial services world and uh, talking about investing. Now, I think it's an interesting choice that they gave us for this title, relational investment. But, you know, it's been pointed out to us that you can use the concept of deposits and withdrawals when it comes to relationships. For example, when you think about withdrawals, what is a withdrawal when it comes to a relationship? Well, it might be doing something that causes hardship, undue effort, 
pain. It subtracts value. Can you think of anything that would be a withdrawal in a relationship? Anyone, whether you're in Zoom or here in a class, what would be a withdrawal? Well, let me help your thinking. Criticism. Arguments. Disrespect of someone's time. Being inconsiderate. I don't have time right now to spend with you. Gossip about the person. When that comes into their life, an awareness of that, that's going to be a withdrawal. On the other hand, what would be deposits? Can you think of anything that would be a deposit when it comes to a relationship? Encouragement. Encouragement. Good. What else? Support. Support. Serve. Serve. Very good. Keeping commitments. Clarifying expectations or your thoughts. Showing integrity. And maybe apologizing, making amends when there's been a wrong. That can become a deposit, potentially. Well, we're in the book of Song of Solomon. Again, we're going to be in chapter 5 today. The context of this passage is the latter part of the book, chapters 5 through chapter 8. And once again, we're talking about the man and the woman. And they are now married, okay? And they learn the value of investing in each other rather than giving up on each other when they face some kind of a conflict or a disagreement. The verbal descriptions that are in this, in this book that they're used are very interesting. She, okay, she describes him in loving ways that reflect her love for him. He told her that he had never seen anyone as beautiful as she. Yes, her physical beauty, but also the strength of her character. And you're not going to believe what else he did. He puts her on a, excuse me, let me get that out. I don't know what happened with that. Sorry about that, folks. What else did he do? He put her on a chariot and rode her through the city so that everyone could get a look at this beautiful bride of his, this beautiful beauty queen. Now, ladies, this was a different day. I don't think we should expect the guys to find a chariot or set up some kind of a parade. But that's, what, that's what he did, okay? He also used word pictures that describe the depth of his love for her. He noted how he longed to be with her. And she affirmed the exclusive bond that they had together with each other. Last week, Will pointed out to us that she was concerned that they belonged together. They had an absolute commitment to each other. So, those are key points for us to understand. She uses the verbiage in chapter 7 and chapter 8. She said, I want him with me always. At the very end of the poem, you know, I mentioned the chariot a minute ago. The very end of the poem, you see that, that imagery there. Her being on this chariot, he drives her around the city. Now, if it was in Texas and it was in 2020, I guess it would have to be a... Chevrolet Silverado or a Ford F-150 that he would be driving her around uh, the city on it. But as, as they're riding on this chariot, she is leaning on him as they arrive in the city. I asked my wife on the way to, uh, to come here this morning, I said, do you remember anything different about the first car that we had when we were dating and versus the car we have now and all cars today. And she said, I'm not really sure. And I noted the fact, no, I want to note the fact that we'll answer, we'll get the answer in the lesson this morning. The difference is this. 
1957 Chevrolet had a front seat that went all the way across. There was no drink holder in the middle, right? Okay. So she could lean on me as we were driving down the street. And now we have seat belts. So she's parked over here and I'm parked over there. You know, so we can't do any more of this leaning while you're driving down the road. But that's the picture that we see here, this intimacy, this uh, relationship. And there is a resilience in their love. Nothing can stop it. Death will not stop the love that they share. It's, it's like a fire that consumes everything because they are all in for each other. That's, that's the imagery that we're seeing in this, this book. And it's, you know, I just meditate, think again and again, isn't it striking that God put in his word this, these descriptions about intimacy and this relationship, but there are implications, there are applications that we're going to see this morning, certainly within the context of marriage, but in other relationships as well. So we're going to start reading the scripture together, and do I have an online volunteer who would read verses 6 through 8? Anybody online be willing to read that? Chapter 5. Chapter 5. Chapter 5. Okay, Joyce is going to read that for us. Chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. If you'll follow along in your copy of the scripture. Okay? I'm not hearing you. I, I had to unmute. <laughs> okay, okay, all right. Uh, 6 through 5. 5, 6 through 8. Yes. I opened for my lover but my lover had left. He was gone. My heart sank at his departure. I looked for him, but did not find him. I called him, but he did not answer. The watchmen found me, and they made their rounds in the, as I made their rounds in the city. They beat me, they bruised me, they took away my cloak. Those watchmen of the, of the walls, O oh, daughter of Jerusalem, I charge you, if you are my lover, what will you tell him? Tell him I am faint with love. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Now, in chapter 3, it appears there, and it also appears here in chapter 5, that what's being described is actually a dream. And if you look at the first couple of verses of chapter 5, it's like in the dream, okay? And we, we're assuming this is a dream that's being described here that she hears a knock at the door. It's like her husband, and she finally gets up to go, but he's not there. And so she, looking for him, she needs him, but he's not there. And so if you notice in verse 6, that last part, it says, my soul, soul, failed me when he spoke, because he's not there. And she calls out. There's no answer. She doesn't hear and the picture that's being painted in this passage is of a spouse, in this case a wife, who is feeling deserted. Now, those of us here in the United States, you know, we may have a little bit more difficulty in, in latching on to the, the impact of a dream. I've never lived among the Israelites, but I have lived among the Chinese, and I can tell you that eastern part of the world dreams are really important and they, they they attach a lot many times to dreams and so uh, one of the things that is being painted here in this in this passage is feeling deserted and he's not with her she feels alone and it goes on to describe uh, this this person and she's feeling this this sense of absence this emotional desertion if you will a lack of emotional support that it goes on in verse 7 and it says she, she gets up she goes out in the dream the watchman found me earlier they had found her in chapter 3 you see it there and there was not any abuse there but in this case in verse 7 notice what happens they beat her they bruised her they took away her cloak or her veil absolute embarrassment absolute abuse in this situation and this dream at that point to me it looks like it's turning into a nightmare you know this this total 
uh, eruption that's taking place in her heart. And so this is a very severe situation, but it's connected with you know, her husband's not there. He's absent. She's exposed. Now they've taken this away. And so she sees the daughters of the Jerusalem. She sees other women there in the city. And she noticed in verse 8 when it says, I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved, okay, if you find him, that you tell him what? What is she supposed to tell him? What are they supposed to tell him if they find him? What does it say? <laughs> I am what? I am sick with love. <laughs> okay, she is completely upset in this moment. And so six times in the fifth chapter, six times she refers to him as her love, her beloved, and no one, nothing can replace him. He is at the, the centerpiece of her heart relationally. Okay? And so... I would just underscore this point. In relationships, how important it is for us to be there for people, to be there for one another, particularly in a, in a marriage relationship. You know, uh, from time to time, I just have to go back and use stories and illustrations and examples from life in Taiwan. There's a saying that the Taiwanese people have, when food is on the table, it's just been cooked. It's just been completed. It's now on the table. It's ready to eat. They'll, they'll say, come eat. But they also say another little phrase, two words. We'd say in English, get it while it's hot. It's hot. Yeah. Get it now. Okay? <laughs> Don't wait. Don't let it get cold. Come now while it's hot. And so, I don't know, there's something about me. I'm a little bit impatient. When I see hot food, I'm ready to start eating, you know? I just can't wait. Let's have the prayer. Uh, and so, uh, you know, the opportunities that we have in life in relationships, husbands, wives, we have opportunities in our relationships. This is the moment that we have. It's hot now. We're not talking about sensuality. We're talking about the presence, the, the moment that we have been that's been given to us. Let's let's do all that we can to savor this moment, to use it for the, the best. That we can and that's true in marriage it's true in relationships that we have with people to to take those opportunities so so very seriously as we relate to one another now verse 9 goes on there's a call to remember and uh this is a key point would someone in in the classroom be willing to read or just verse 9 for us who would read that for us Okay, Don. What is your beloved more than <clears throat> another beloved? O oh, fairest among women, what is your beloved more than another beloved that ye so charge us? Okay, so the daughters of Jerusalem, the gals that she has encountered in the stream as she's gone out into the city, are asking a very important question. You know, you would think. This woman's trying to find her husband. You would think they would just say something like, sure, sure, sure. We'll, we'll tell him. We're telling him you're looking for him. But they don't do that. They get a little bit, you might say, a little bit feisty in asking her this question. You know, what is so special about this guy? And they ask it twice. What is your beloved more than any other beloved, oh, most beautiful among women? <laughs> what are you going to say? Well, you know, the reality is their attitude may not have been so kind or gracious or whatever. They might have been a little scarfy or, you know, snarky or whatever. But the, but the fact is, um, it's an important question. It's kind of like a wake-up call. Yeah. What is so special about this guy? What is so special about my husband? Maybe she's got to go back to her wedding day. Okay, and, you know, think about the fact, okay, here I am, I'm standing before this group of people coming to witness this wedding. I'm standing before this, this group of people. Now I'm standing next to this guy, and I'm committing myself to him. What is it that's about him that makes me say I'm ready to, to tie up with him for the rest of my life? 
or from the guy. What is so special about her that I'm ready to commit myself to her the rest of my life? Let me just read a sample of those vows. No one's getting married here this morning, but <laughs> just think about it again. I, Robert, take you, Donna, to be my wife, to have, to hold from this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish, till death do us part. Or maybe your vows were a little bit more, not just traditional, more like this contemporary set of vows. I promise to hold your hand every night and to never let us lose our spark. I vow to have the patience that love demands, to speak when words are needed, and to share in the silence when they are not. I vow to be giving and forgiving, to make you laugh, and to laugh at myself. Well, the vows that you made, those of you that are married, the vows that you made were important. She has to go back and think about what is it that I committed to? And you know, uh, many years ago, I had the opportunity to serve as a pastor and uh, performed numerous wedding ceremonies. And when couples would come and ask me to do that, I said, that's, that's great, but I have a requirement. We have to have two counseling sessions together. And in the first counseling session, I would talk with them about uh, whether or not they knew Christ. That was one of the key things that I wanted to understand. And in 2006, I believe it was, we had come back from Taiwan. We were in the United States, and I was introduced to a Taiwan couple, a Taiwanese couple working on their doctorates at a university in Richmond, Virginia, and they wanted to get married. And they wanted someone who could speak Taiwanese to do the wedding. So they sought me out. Their friend introduced them. So here I am, and I come to find out neither one of them were Christians. Huh. And uh, typically, I would not marry a Christian and a non-Christian because I said, you know, I, I don't do those kind of weddings. I need to go someone else. But here, neither one were Christian. So I shared the gospel with them. They were not ready to make a, a commitment to Christ. In that moment, I, I, I think Will referenced it last week in, his, in the lesson about the triangle. So, you know, marriage is a triangular relationship. What is that? And I talked about Christ and having a relationship with him. And I said, you know, the closer that we get to him personally, that will break through a lot of garbage in a relationship and a marriage. And it will also enhance a husband and wife being drawn closer together. Well, they heard that. We went through the wedding ceremony and the wedding ceremony was over. They got their degrees, went to their graduation. They went on up to uh, New Jersey and uh, she got a job and, and he was looking for a job, and, and uh, we got news one day, and they said, you know what, we've been married now for about a year or so. We began to find out that what you talked about in that triangle, that we needed Christ. And both of them had become Christians and joined a church up there in, in New Jersey. Didn't happen while they were in Virginia. We didn't have a chance to see them baptized or anything else, but we had a chance to go up and visit them. And they're still good friends. They've gone back to Taiwan now. And, and uh, But I just think about that, and I think about another couple, that that uh, young couple in Kaohsiung, Taiwan, and this was about three or four years ago, and they came up, came up to me, and and uh, he, the husband, said to me, it was good back before they married, he said to me, marriage is a 50-50 relationship, right? I said, nope, it isn't. I said, marriage is a, we'll say it last week, 100%, 100%. You got to be all in. I don't think he ever, he ever bought into it because they had some problems. They, I think, worked through those problems. But if it's not the presence of Christ in that relationship, it's going to come down a lot of times that I said, she said, and the arguments. And that goes down a pretty negative, slippery slope. So 
I'm going to stop for just a second and ask you another question. And I hope you can come into that with some answers, okay? Where are you right now in your investments with your spouse? Where are you right now in your investments with coworkers, with children, with neighbors? Where are you? Are you giving attention to making deposits? Or have there only been withdrawals? Are you pouring benefit, kindness, helpfulness, support, encouragement into their life? Well, let's go on in the, in the next verses verse 10 through verse 16, and would someone in the classroom be willing to read those verses for us? Anyone? My lover is radiant and ruddy, outstanding among 10,000. His head is pure gold, his hair is wavy, and black as a raven. His eyes are like doves by the water streams, washed in milk, mounted like jewels. His cheeks are like beds of spice, yielding perfume. His lips are like lilies dripping with myrrh. His arms are rods of gold set with cherosolite. His body is like polished ivory, decorated with sapphires. His legs are pillars of marble, set on bases of pure gold. His appearance is like Lebanon, choice as its cedars. His mouth is sweetness itself. He is altogether lovely. This is my lover, this my friend. O daughters of Jerusalem. As I read this uh, in our lesson, I was glad that uh, we had to focus on the guy and not the lady today because it, it, it uh, when well, you go back and read what he says about the lady, I thought the guy was a little bit more, you know, uh, okay for the classroom group. <laughs> but uh, I, I like this passage. Um, it, uh, is telling us here why some of the reasons that she loves this guy. He's handsome better than anyone she's ever seen. She starts with his head, his hair, his eyes. His eyes captivated her because she loves him so much. Okay? And it says they're like gentle doves, tranquil, gentle, peaceful, but also alert to what's whatever's going on. His cheeks. His cheeks are like spices. He is, you know, didn't, they didn't have cologne back then, but spices. His <laughs> lips, they, they drip with, with liquid myrrh, a spice grown in Arabia. It smells good. The words out of his mouth are very pleasing. And he does not have a big belly. You should only give him a side-to-side -side hug because of a big belly. No, his belly is rock hard, okay? Not blubbery, not spongy. And these two have a romance, a friendship that is growing stronger with time. So that's the, that's the imagery that, that she gives about, about this man that she loves. Now, let's, let's bring this back just a minute. And I want to ask the question a little differently this time. And I welcome you to, to respond verbally, okay, whether you're online or in the, in the classroom. Imagine that it's you. You're having a conversation with a newly married couple. And this newly married couple, okay, young couple, younger couple probably, they are also brand new Christians. What would you point out to them in terms of similar investments that they can make in their relationship in their marriage, but also in their relationship with God. Brand new Christians, but also newlyweds. 
What can you say to them about relationships that will enhance their relationship <laughs> together, but also their relationship with God? What would you say to them? I think I'd share about Jesus being my hero, and in Galatians, what he talks about the fruit of the Spirit, and that it really does work and makes a difference. Okay. All right. Makes a difference in our relationship with, with him. Makes our relationship with the spouse enhanced greatly. What else would you share? And who they with? Brand new Christian. Communication. Communication. Excellent. And and what and what this what if this new Christian says, uh, my God. So how do I communicate with God? Through prayer and reading His Word. All right, through prayer, reading His Word. Okay, so it's a two-way. Com it is communication. <clears throat> it's listening as well as speaking. What else would you say about relationship with God? With a spouse, advice you're going to give to them. I, I was tell them that their journey might be planned in their life, but that God has the ultimate say so, and that there's going to be coming changes that they can either fight them or work with God. Okay, so there are going to be changes ahead in your life, and you, and you can either work with God or you can resist and go down a pretty bumpy road. Okay, excellent. Joyce, did, did, did you have something? No, I thought you were wanting to say something. Donna? I like what it says in here, too, at the end of this chapter when it says that it was her, like her best friend. And I think that's a very simple thing to say. But, <coughs> but when we say that, that says a lot. It's a very deep meaning. And I think that's something to remember that when you, you just don't hurt your best friend. You, you do whatever you can to keep that relationship through the years and, and it means everything to you and it's very precious whether it's God or mm -hmm. think your spouse exactly. in order to have a good relationship with God it does take time Same with your take, it takes time to have a good relationship with God and so you know we had the invitation this morning whether you're able to make it or not on the 12th there's going to be a date night uh, for for couples. Has anybody been married 60 years in our group? I don't know, but maybe there's somebody. Steve, I but, think uh, you have been. <laughs> yeah, Steve, Steve and Helene, probably. Okay. All right. Well, you know, there there are there are things that carry over certainly in the marriage relationship, which is pivotal, but also in our relationship with God, our relationship with others, time listening to what they say, being available to serve them, to help them, being open, being transparent, seriously considering their advice, paying attention to their instruction on certain things. Uh, these are, are vital as we live and as we journey together and as we're in relationship with one another. Um, since we're focused in this passage specifically on marriage, I couldn't help but think about a song. And I'm not going to play a song for you this morning, but I wanted to read the words of this song. And I think everybody in here will have heard this song, will recognize the lyrics, and will recognize who sang it. So I'm not, that's just going to read the lyrics, okay? So, but just, just think about it. We've, we've read about the ancient description that the wife gave about her husband, but here's a more, a little bit more up to date, uh, or no, another uh, from this era, if you will. Love me tender, love me sweet. <laughs> Never let me go. You have made my life complete, and I love you so. Love me tender, love me true, all my dreams fulfill. For my darling, I love you, and I always will. Love me tender. Love me long. Take me to your heart. For it is there that I belong and will never part. Love me tender. Love me true. All my dreams fulfill. For my darling, I love you, and I always will. Love me tender. Love me dear. Tell me you are mine. 
I'll be yours through all the years till the end of time. Love me tender, love me true. All my dreams fulfill. For my darling, I love you. And I always will. <laughs> you don't remember that, do you? <laughs> I think everybody remembers that song. Yeah, so if you have Amazon, you can pull it up on Amazon Music and listen to it again. But uh, anyway, well, I'm going to pause there. Anybody have any comment or, or feedback from our study of these verses today? Yes, somebody? Okay. I, I feel sorry for Adam and Eve. She's the most beautiful woman. And oh, well, let's see. And. <laughs> I mean, she's the only woman, so <laughs> I just can't imagine how much trouble he had describing his feelings. <laughs> Sorry, it's kind of off in that <laughs> Since he didn't have anything to compare it to. <laughs> <laughs> Good insight. <laughs> Any other comment? Inside. <laughs> well, we've uh, concluded a little bit before we normally do this morning. Uh, so, uh, if anybody needs to take a, on a date uh, mm -hmm. for lunch, that's that will work out for Donna. Yes. Um, just letting everyone know that uh, you know we've been trying to get our class officers together and everything, and um, the area that. I'm trying to help in is the area of outreach and everything. So we are working on that. And I know that uh, this morning, Tommy already mentioned, as well as Jeremy, uh, in the announcement time, I guess it was, that they were talking about uh, prayer walking. So I don't know where we stand on that, but we're talking about, we're talking with Nance Elementary School and our class working with Betty and our church of possibly adopting that school and uh, They've already been, you know, positive and talked about how we can help. But one of the schools that they mentioned this morning of prayer walking was Nance. Now, it not, might not be possible for some people to come at 6 o'clock next Sunday to get together to prayer walk over there. But you can certainly pray for the school. And so that's an area that we're talking about as a class of really focusing on what can we do and our ways with the church to help. Now, there are other things that our class will be involved in internationally, maybe with a, uh, the Operation Christmas Child when we get the boxes together and some other things. And maybe there are things in our class that we need to do to help each other. So this is not just a one thing, but since Jeremy brought it up this morning, I was just gonna mention it, Tommy already read it. I don't know how we feel about it, but that's certainly an opportunity. So, you know, because you can make a decision what you yeah. want to do as a class or whatever. So they suggested next Sunday at six. I don't know. Yeah. I, I'm bringing it up for discussion. Yeah. Any thoughts? Feedback? It's not easy for everybody to get out. So that's why I said we could even say, what about at six o'clock that we all just set that side of time to pray however you want to do it. But that, that is our emphasis because you know, it's a uh, Labor Day weekend next weekend. And that might be a little complicated for people, but if we really have the heart to say, okay, we're asking all of us to join together for Nance Elementary, for the teachers, for, um, you know, everyone who's involved in that school process, for the kids who don't get lunches.